Welcome to another episode of the Bring Your Own Grief Network Studios. I am, as always, your humbled host, R. Glenn Kelly, father to my angel son, Jonathan Taylor Kelly, who guides me in his legacy every moment. Uh, you know, I hear it all the time in my workshops. I'm so angry. I feel like I'm going to break something. I'm afraid I'm going to hurt someone or hurt myself. Is it wrong to be angry? How do I deal with my anger? Now, if this hits home for you or someone you know, stick around for this special episode from the Bring Your Own Grief Network Studios, Mad About Grief, Managing Anger and Bereavement, and we'll talk about why you should not avoid your own Incredible Hulk. Now, you'll forgive the reference to the Incredible Hulk there in the opening, but for those of you not so familiar with Marvel Comics and the multi-million dollar Avenger movie series of late, and not to show my age, but I did read those things called comic books back in my day and, and listen to AM radio too, and yeah, we roll our car windows up and down with a thing called a crank handle. And I own it, but I digress. Back to the Hulk for a second, huh? Because I'm just running with it now. Dr. David Banner, a Marvel comic book character, is a mild-mannered scientist who, because of a freak lab accident, turns into a rage-filled green giant beast of a man whenever someone or something makes him mad. His famous line, whenever someone gets in his face and threatens a good doctor, don't make me angry, you won't like me when I'm angry. And he meant it too. He wasn't being snarky. He was trying to warn them, others around him, of the dangers in his anger. And he did not like becoming the Hulk either because he could not control his actions within the rage. But he had no choice in the matter. When angered, he became the Incredible Hulk. The true Dr. Banner was buried inside, didn't know himself, and the rage continued until the threat was stopped and the Hulk shrunk back down in size. Then... Dr. Banner reawakens each time, exhausted, drained, and unaware of the destruction he caused when the Hulk was unleashed. Wow. Sound familiar? Listen, you've been through a lot, and I am so very sorry for your loss as I know you are of mine. There are just so many emotions balled up inside this thing we call grief, right? And guess what? You and I probably share many of those feelings. Not on the same level, mind you since no two of us will ever grieve alike. We're all as different as snowflakes and fingerprints, aren't we? But it's a darn good bet we probably both felt shock, confusion, fear, longing, or sorrow, or despair, or guilt, and that really big green one, anger. So let's go back to the question I said I hear a lot. Is it wrong to be angry? Is it wrong that I have so much anger after someone I love so much has died? wrong to be angry? Are you kidding me? No, it is absolutely not wrong to be angry. Actually, just the opposite. Anger is a natural, normal way of coping with your loss, friend, and can be a healthy part of your path to hope and healing. Quick aside here, go back to my previous episode on emotions and remind yourself that stuffing your feelings back inside will only make things worse. It can jack you up pretty bad, actually. If nothing else, it will certainly slow down this thing we call the healing process and keep us from moving forward. And just another reminder, don't worry, we don't leave our lost loved one behind when we move forward in healing. Regardless, back to it. My gosh, you certainly have a valid reason to be angry. You had someone you deeply loved taken from you, didn't you? And against your will, against your control, and that hurts. That brings pain, and let me clue you in on something here. No matter how much some will relegate anger to many different triggers, getting angry really only comes down to this. Think about it. Someone or some event has taken something from you, physically or emotionally, against your will. And that makes you hurt. Emotional pain, and you want that pain to stop. It's not a natural condition of the mind to hurt. 
Just like the body has a natural state of being healthy and will attempt to mend itself when wounded, your mind has a natural state of ease or happiness. It wants to be happy. It's our preferred default emotional state. Don't worry, be happy, right? Now, I don't mean giggly, stupid happy all the time, but just consider that everything we have done since the dawn of time as a species has been achieving one result. What is that? Do you know? Being happier, right? Back when we ran across the Serengeti, we were miserable, unhappy, living and sleeping in the rain. So we built shelters. We found happiness in developing livestock and agriculture so we didn't have to go on long and dangerous hunting trips for food, right? We turned horse-drawn carriages into the Ford F-150 off-road package. With leather, right? Made us happy. Heck, even our founding fathers declared we have a right to happiness. So, you know there must be a predisposed idea for it, right? And being angry is, well, not being happy. Not being in our natural state. And when something happens to threaten or take away that natural state, we want it back and will escalate mental and physical responses as needed to get it. And sometimes that means escalating to anger. So, if it's so natural and we say it's healthy, then why is it so hard to control this anger? Why do we become the Incredible Hulk at times? Well, here's part of the reason why. Like all emotions, anger actually originates as an urge to action in the subconscious mind. Even though you become aware of it in the conscious, thinking part of your brain once it kicks in. You darn well know when you're angry, don't you? But again, the urge which may eventually become anger came from your subconscious, that part of you that acts on your behalf without your conscious effort or control, and not out of malice either. It's not urging you in any way to harm yourself. It's pushing that emotion to thought action, to help you. Everything the subconscious pushes forward for you, it believes for one reason or another, you need it. Hmm. Let's take it to the physical side for a second because it's one part of it I think we can both relate to. What happens when someone is physically causing you pain? Not emotional pain, but attacking you, inflicting bodily harm on you. Well, you feel the pain all right and you realize something is about to be taken away. Your health or, or even your life against your will. And this causes the emotional pain so subconscious response kicks in. <laughs> There's an adrenaline boost. Your brain works faster. Your eyes become sharper. You have additional strength, all to increase your own mental and physical abilities to hopefully stop the pain from being inflicted by your attacker. Actually, this doesn't mean you automatically become the Hulk and begin ripping your attacker apart limb from limb. No, you go into fight or flight mode first. <laughs> where your, your, your faster thinking brain has to decide whether it's better to stop the onslaught of pain by, by staying and kicking butt or by hightailing it the heck out of there. Make sense? Anyway, back to the emotional side now. As you and I have experienced loss of a loved one, someone we love deeply, someone we wanted in our lives forever has been taken from us, certainly against our will, against our control, and we are emotionally hurt by that. Now, the cold hard fact, friend, reality is that people die every moment of every day, whether through natural causes or random acts. It's something we are really aware of, aren't we? We know that. So if we were purely rational, emotional robots, we would realize just that, and the death of anyone around us would be just another event in our lives, something that just happened to us. We lost someone we love. But we're not thoughtless robots, are we? We don't live expecting our loved ones to go. Now, not off topic here, but we live our lives in what is called the normalcy bias, meaning we don't expect bad things to happen. We expect things to be the same day after day, normal, even though risk is evident everywhere around us. Incredible numbers of people die in car accidents every day, don't they? Yet, you don't get in your car to go to work with a fear of being in a car accident. People live in earthquake-prone California or tornado-infested Oklahoma 
where history shows Mother Nature could rear her ugly side at any moment and take lives. Yet we voluntarily live there, don't we? Expecting it will never happen to us. The normalcy bias, get it? Same with our loved ones. We don't expect them to pass on. And sadly, when they do, as we've experienced, we want our loved ones back. We did not want that loved one taken from our lives and we are emotionally in pain. When it happens, the subconscious attempts to come to the rescue and sends urges to actions to help remedy that pain. And it starts out innocently enough. <laughs> what do we do? What can we do? Well, this isn't working. Let's, let's escalate to the next level. Well, that's not working either. Oh God, something more. I want them back. Bigger and bigger attempts are made to remedy the situation. Still nothing. Adrenaline kicks in to give you greater abilities to think your way out of it or use greater strength to fight or run your way out of it. Your mind is going faster, but nothing is working. You're agitated, frustrated, then yes, angry. And if you're not careful, the big green hulk comes out. And this usually continues until the rational mind determines that all that can be done has been done. It is certainly not the conclusion we want, but it's the one we must come to accept, come to terms with. Now, when we talk of anger, of course that doesn't mean we necessarily go into full-blown rage. Everyone is different, and what level we shrink back to Dr. Banner can be based on a great many individualized factors. Now, the one common thread, though, is the other difficulties present during the early stages of our loss when so many other raw, painful emotions are swirling around our hearts and minds. That helps fuel the frustration levels, muddies our focus, confuses rational thought. Confusion causes anxiety, and anxiety fuels frustration, and frustration fuels anger. It feeds the beast, right? Be careful of this. And there's another thing I want to bring up at this point that darn well might help the pain grow into a raging green giant. False anger. The anger you feel for the fact that your loved one was taken against your will, against your control, and you can't have them back, can be coupled with some confusing things about the loss, which later will prove to be just not true. I had a lot of false anger for a while after my son passed. He went through a relatively simple medical procedure when his heart failed in the hospital recovery room, and he passed away. Although no medical procedure is without risk, I was damn sure angry at the surgeon, his staff, the hospital, and anyone who had anything to do with it. But fortunately, I would use my anger to hire an independent medical review board to get answers and discovered that there was nothing the medical personnel could have done to reverse the outcome. My anger for them was misplaced. And afterward, I would go on to join the hospital's advisory board to help the parents of other children. Keep that in mind, please. That was constructive anger. And let me talk about that for a moment. There is constructive anger. And as you probably know or can guess, there is destructive anger too. A good analogy. Think of the two as the high road and the low road. Constructive, high road. Destructive, the low road. Anger itself is really like an emotional barometer that tells us something is not right and needs to be fixed and we must take action, a road trip if you will, to right the wrong. The road of constructive anger is a more intellectual, rational, thought-enlightened path. It's usually a longer trip, mind you, and requires a lot of thinking, self-control, and patience but you have a greater chance at arriving at your destination, more assured the wrong has been righted. The road of destructive anger is primitive, a dirt road where the possibility of being detoured or hijacked by other emotions is highly probable. It's a road where we are more apt to act on our emotions. Act first, think after. Gun the engine when fear jumps out from behind a bush. Step out with a tire iron when guilt tries to block our journey. As you can imagine, there's a good chance we'll never even get to our destination to right the wrong going down the low road. Down destructive anger. 
As a matter of fact, we'll probably find ourselves lost, out of gas, but still raging in a town we never expected to be, right? Now, you don't need examples of destructive anger, do you? You might know some on a personal level, although I hope not. But maybe that's exactly why we're here. Remember, anger is a natural reaction and can actually be good for healing, as long as you are not harming yourself or others. Take the high road. Use it for good. For me, I channeled it, but not on purpose at first. Along with other angers, I was also extremely livid because what happened was out of my control. I'm a guy. We control things. When we can't, we get angry. So I turned heavily to my woodworking hobby not long after my son passed. I cut things. I hammered things. I shaped things. I controlled things. And I needed that. It's a good thing I moved onto other constructive anger roads in my healing journey, or my entire house would have been filled with homemade furniture a long time ago. And listen, even in constructive anger, your journey on the high road doesn't always end with righting the wrong. But that's really okay. What the heck do I mean by that? Too often, the loss of life is senseless, caused by circumstances that need not be. And ongoing constructive anger in some of these cases has resulted in many, many positive changes to our society as a whole. While you don't necessarily have to take it to this level, let me give you a few examples of where unresolved but constructive grief anger had a tremendous impact on others. First, consider Candy Leitner, founder of Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Her loss came because of intoxicated drivers and she channeled her anger in ways that have resulted in lives being saved that we could never even count. Objectively, we can't show the figures of those who chose not to drive because of the increased efforts of enforcement by police, brought on by MAD, but we can see it in the reduction of annual deaths caused by the drunks on the roadways. Then there is Gloria Yurkovich, founder of Child Find, and Donna Norris, who is responsible for getting the National Amber Alert System enacted to help find abducted children. All three of these amazing, angry people channeled their personal loss of a loved one into something that helped others. So look, you may not be at a point where you want to go on a national crusade, although certainly don't discount that for later. For now, though, you came here to find out about your anger. Is it okay to be angry? And how do I handle that anger? First, again, as we've said, you and me, you're darn skippy, it's okay to be angry. It's natural, normal, and healthy. It's an emotion. You hurt, you feel, and you must recognize that. Now, as I've pointed out in many other episodes on the BYOG, emotions like anger must come out. To keep them stuffed inside is poison to your soul. It might very well originate in the subconscious mind as an innocent urge, but it's an urge to act. And once it gets to the thinking mind, it becomes anger not acted upon, held back day after day after day. Anger will move back to the subconscious mind, festered and ugly, and become a part of who you now are. Always bitter and agitated, angry at the world. You don't want that. That's not moving forward to a life of peace and purpose. That's moving backwards, isn't it? Enough on that. You get it, I know. So, how do you handle your anger so you don't become the Incredible Hulk? Now, I'm a normal Joe, not a big fan of cliched words like anger management, but it's all we've got to work with here, so let's talk anger management for a moment. First, never ever beat yourself up if you didn't like the way you expressed your anger before especially if it's been going on for a while and it snuck back into your subconscious, became who you are now. Well, guess what? It's who you are now. And the only way to get rid of it is to pull it out to the thinking conscious mind as much as possible. Pull it into the light. The light cleanses, right? Now, I'm not talking about an anger expression where you're physically hurting yourself or others. If that's the case, you really do need to seek some professional assistance right away. Sorry, please do so. I'm talking about the events where you can learn to tell yourself, man, that wasn't cool, was it? I got to work on that. Now, I know it sounds hokey, but, but that means you are giving it conscious thought each time, keeping it in the light. Get it? 
pull it out of the subconscious, strip it from who you are deep inside. Got it? Now, when we're looking at anger that comes at the lower levels and you can stop yourself from saying something hurtful or angry to someone else, practice that every time. It helps too. Do the old count to 10 before you respond to someone who might be the target of your anger. Take a breath. Think it through. Take the high road when someone triggers your anger. Get with a friend. Someone you can yell at. I'm a good grief advocate for this. I let people yell at me all the time at workshops or over the phone or on email. Whatever. I'm an old cop. I'm used to people in my face saying nasty things to me. I don't take it personal. I know they're venting. Find a friend who will let you vent. Let you yell. On an overall level, hit the batting cage. Hit the workshop like I did. Get in the car and scream at the top of your lungs to the world. Hell, go out back and break things. Not the good stuff, mind you. Something you don't need and preferably something that belongs to you. You'll be amazed at what venting does. Hit the gym. Throw on some boxing gloves and hit the heavy bag. And speaking of that, let's wind it down here. Most of us know the first rule of fight club, don't we? What is it? Right. There is no fight club. Well, what's the first rule of grief club? Sorry, fellow club members. First rule here, there is a grief club. There is grief. But the second rule is so much more important. Be kind to yourself. You've been through a lot and you have so much more to go. We both do. And we'll get there. Together when we need. By ourselves when we must. But never, ever alone. So, that's it for this special episode, Mad About Grief, Managing Anger and Bereavement from the BYOG Network Studios, where you can bring your own confusions, bring your own emotions, bring your own questions, and bring your own grief. Please consider liking and sharing this episode on Facebook and YouTube. Not all grievers are on both social networks, and it makes it so much easier for others who seek support to find us and the free support we offer. For now, I thank you for being here today. Come back and see us again, won't you? I am Arglin Kelly, father to my angel child, Jonathan Taylor Kelly, who guides me in his legacy every moment. And we both wish you peace and purpose. <laughs>